Under my rule, the people know protection and peace. They would truly drown in blood. His name? Oliver Cromwell. He was a gentleman farmer who fought for Parliament in the Civil War, who rose to the rank of Commander-in-Chief of the Army, who signed the death warrant of King Charles I, who ruled England, Scotland and Ireland alone from 1653 to 1658. But what sort of man was he? When Cromwell died, they wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a coffin lined with lead. Yet his foul stench still broke free. And truly his name and memory stinks even greater than did his corpse. People look back on the days of Oliver Cromwell and praise him so. What brave things he did and oh how all the neighbouring princes did fear him. At first, how glorious, he destroyed all the enemies of Parliament, but then such betrayal. His ambition overtook him, he crushed us underfoot, and all that would oppose him he had removed. The days of Oliver Cromwell were marvellous days of prosperity, liberty, peace. Confused? Cromwell provoked strong feelings of love, of hatred, and these different judgments, different interpretations didn't stop on his death. He's kept historians arguing ever since. Discovering the truth may not be possible. So, first, Cromwell the Army General. It is 1645. Two English armies face each other, one for the king, the other for parliament. The final battle of the first civil war is about to be fought. The enemy was drawn up, ready to give us battle at Naseby. We would have been cut off before we were drawn into battle formation. But Lieutenant General Cromwell drew us up into a body, ready to face the enemy. We marched yesterday after the king. After three hours' very doubtful fight, we at last routed his army. Sir, this is none other but the hand of God on our side, and to him alone belongs the glory. Naseby was a great victory for Parliament. 500 royalists dead, 5,000 prisoners taken, 100,000 pounds of plunder recovered. And though Cromwell wasn't yet commander-in-chief, few would deny him his moment of glory. Cromwell and I, we go way back. I was with him in the Fens when he raised his first troop. But I've never seen his genius so sharp as it was today. I'd say he won the battle, and belike he'll win us this war. You see, the skill's not in the charge. Any Tom Fool can charge. The skill's in controlling the charge, turning the cavalry with you, rounding back into the fight. And on a day like today, with the mud thick, that's something. I'm proud to serve such a man. What was Cromwell out to achieve? That's always the question to ask, and at this point, it's not difficult to answer. He wanted Parliament to win the war, quickly, efficiently. If that meant creating a new type of army, so be it. Cromwell makes officers of those that were but lately merely yeomen. It's as if he wants the nation's beggars to rise in mighty numbers and set up for themselves to the utter ruin of all the nobility and gentry. He won't touch men of rank in his troop. He'll only recruit common men, poor, of mean parentage. Well, why not? If a tinker or an apprentice has backbone and wit enough, I'd rather follow him than some gentleman picked for his title. You should see the royalist leaders. Their noses stuck in Julius Caesar like you can learn war from a book. Or they think, it's all right. I've hunted foxes. I'll get by. Tell you. Well, some of our own generals are as bad. You need professionals. Ability, not nobility. And Cromwell alone understands that. Cromwell had created a new model army. A force of soldiers disciplined and efficient, regardless of their backgrounds. It won Pollum at the war. But his success had made him many enemies. Oh, there's such nonsense surrounding this jumped-up farmer Cromwell. They say he promotes on experience. Funny how his son-in-law is doing so well. They say his military genius is unrivaled. Rubbish. He just has more men. 
Seven years ago, Cromwell was gathering dust on the back benches of Parliament. Now he struts around the country with a drunken, victorious army on his tail. And they say he would bring his majesty to trial. Can you imagine? Cromwell is not fit to lick the king's bootstraps. The year is 1649. King Charles has been brought to trial. He refuses to recognize the court's authority, but nevertheless, the verdict is guilty. Charles Stuart, King of England, trusted to rule according to the rules of this land, had a wicked plan to rule as he wanted. Like a traitor, he waged war against Parliament and people. So he is responsible for all the murders, burnings, damage and destruction caused during the war. He is a tyrant, traitor, murderer and an enemy of the people of England. The King's fate lay in the hands of the Army Council, of which Cromwell was a leading member. It took them a week to reach a decision. We didn't begin this war because we wished the King dead, but to free him from his evil counsellors. But the King betrayed our trust. Cromwell wanted a settlement, but Charles Stuart went to Scotland. He began a second bloody war. He has the guts of England on his hands and he's lost the right to be called King. And though it burns his conscience, Cromwell and his colleagues on the Army Council must deliver us from this evil. On January 30th, 1649, King Charles I was beheaded outside his palace at Whitehall. Oh, truly, there is a space in hell reserved for Cromwell now. To kill his king, to kill God's chosen one. Oh, the shame. And the trial was a farce. They had no authority, except the authority that comes from cannon and shot. For the army stood by at Cromwell's whim. Oh, yes, the king died because no one dared stand up to Mr. Tyrant Cromwell. Oh, truly, what is to become of England now? It all depended on Cromwell's intentions. He'd killed the king, but what did he hope to achieve? It's getting harder to answer. Troll his writings, his speeches, any clues lurking there? Truly, I'm not wedded or glued to any particular form of government. We need a settlement, certainly, something that'll work, perhaps with something of a monarch in it. You see, the king's head was not taken off because he was king, but because he'd betrayed his trust. Whatever happens, we must avoid division. Cromwell appeared confused. Politics seemed a great deal more complicated than winning battles. Others, however, had quite clear ideas. They saw the death of the king and hoped for a shake-up in society. And Cromwell, they felt, was the man who would make it happen. Oh, Cromwell, where art thou going? You wear the victor's laurels, the army is yours. Snap your fingers, it'll happen. Everything we ever wanted, rights, freedoms, the well-being of every man, every woman, every child. You think we're dreaming? No! For does not the Bible say, overturn, 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 and it will happen. A vote for every man. A parliament that answers to no lord or king, but to the people. Yes! Listen to our demands and do not let us down. Cromwell's response was unexpected and unforgiving. I tell you, sir. You have no other way to deal with these men but to break them. Or they will break you and bring all the blood and treasure spent in this kingdom upon your heads and shoulders. You must break them. On the 13th of May, 1649, four levellers were executed outside Burford Church on Cromwell's command. Oh, Cromwell, where art thou going? These were your men. On the field of Naseby, they put their trust in God for you. They kept their powder dry for you. Without them, you would have been nothing. But you have no ears for the common man. Their pleas you answer with the firing squad. We have been badly used. Cromwell wasn't a revolutionary. His upbringing was comfortable. He owned property, and like most people at the time, saw property as the qualification for power. He spelled out his position clearly. A nobleman, a gentleman, a yeoman. These distinctions are good for the country, 
It wouldn't be right to make all equal, to make the tenant as rich as the landlord. These ideas encourage only those of the criminal classes. Is this a contradiction? That a man who has killed a king still puts such faith in rank, order, position? Maybe. Does the next stage in the story reveal his intentions more clearly? It's 1653. Four years have passed since the king's death. England has yet to find a settlement that keeps the peace. Cromwell is in supreme control of the army. Lord General Cromwell came to the house and began pacing the floor and said, You are no parliament. I will end your sitting. Then he called in 20 or 30 musketeers. Then Cromwell, pointing to the speaker, said, Fetch him down. He went to the table where the mace lay and said, Take away these baubles. The soldiers took away the mace. The house went out. You know what they say, truth will out. I've always said Cromwell was just a bully, and now he's proved it. No, he hasn't. All he's proved is desperate times need desperate measures. Cromwell is no dictator. He consults his council, but his parliaments let him down. He hoped for people who felt as he did, but instead he got weaklings and fools. I hear you got promotion. It'll be my privilege to supervise the Western counties. You ignorant, pompous fool. You soldiers are despised, and now Cromwell will have you rule the nation. And he is to be Lord Protector. Oh, Lord, protect us from such vanity. Cromwell was hated by the royalists and hated by the revolutionaries on Parliament's side. Could he win over the people in the middle? The trouble was that the only person with the right to rule was Charles Stuart, the son of the dead king. Cromwell had no right only the power through military strength to do what he wanted. For two years he tried to find a parliament he could work with, but in 1655 fell back on the army. Right, I have my orders. To collect taxes, to ban unlawful assemblies, to close theatres, pubs, race meetings, gambling dens, to cancel Christmas, to find those who swear or curse twelvepence, and place drunkards in the stocks. Hmm. I think Cromwell's orders will be carried through. Oh, the joy of a sharpened pike. The rule of the major generals brought law and order, but Cromwell still looked for a more legal base to his power. England had always been a monarchy. Perhaps he should be king. It might win over the people in the middle and make him less dependent on the army. I am commanded by the Parliament of England, Scotland and Ireland to present this humble petition and advice unto your highness. They desire to give the head of government a new name which is of king and hope that your highness will take that name which is better known and more suitable than that of a protector. Many felt England would be more stable if he became king. Others were scornful. A king is God's appointed, and Cromwell will never be that. Instead, he mimics kingship. Westminster Palace he has made his home. Hampton Court for the weekends. Butlers and underbutlers and pages and grooms and gentlemen of the bedchamber and gentlemen of my Lord Protector's pisspot. And when he assumed that title, Lord Protector, oh, the pomp and majesty. He wanted to be a king, all right. Well, did we kill one king to make another? I followed that man from Edgehill to Dunbar, but not to have him swagger in pompous majesty. And what, will his son inherit in his turn? I would laugh were it not the tears well up in my eyes. I sent him a letter, begged him to consider what he's doing. It's the Parliament that tempts him. No one in the army wants this. Indeed, I've heard the colonels threaten to shoot him in the head if he should take the crown. Cromwell turned the crown down. Why? No one can be sure. Maybe it stuck against his principles. Maybe he knew it would appall many in the army, and without the army, he could not rule. Have we heard all? Do any witnesses to Cromwell's character remain unheard? In Anamun spirit navelin yard, Murish a There is one more voice. It speaks Gaelic, the tongue of the Irish. Without this voice, no verdict on Cromwell's character is possible. In the name of the Father, full of virtue, and the Son who suffered pain, 
listen, for in my eyes the story still unfolds. How there was a breach in the wall, and how the bodies of Cromwell's men filled the breach, but still they came. And how Cromwell was white with fighting fury, and called no prisoners, and how his army of saints set to their butchery, and how innocent men and women and children fell before him. It wasn't just soldiers they killed. They nailed a baby to a church door. Excuse me. The Irish Catholics had been in revolt against English Protestants in Ireland since 1641. In 1649, it fell on Cromwell as Lord General to restore order. He made it clear the mission would be welcome. It hath pleased God to bless our endeavour at Drogheda. The enemy made a stout resistance, but God, giving a new courage to our men, they attempted again and entered, beating the enemy from their defences. Our men were ordered by me to put all defendants to the sword. I do not think 30 of the whole number escaped with their lives. When I think back on what we did, the gorge rises in my throat. But there was God in my sword hand, and God smiled all the more with every sinful, papist, rebel split. One's duty can be terrible, but one's duty can never be ignored. Cromwell felt no need to excuse his actions in Ireland. In his eyes, his victims were Catholic, and so beneath contempt. Cromwell and his men forced us from our homes. It was the middle of winter. The roads were thick with snow. Our lands, you see, were rich, fit for Englishmen, not for native Irish. Not that we weren't given the choice. To hell or Connacht, they said. Either you die, or you grub your way out west, to eke out a meagre existence in a land so barren you'll die there anyway. There was famine. Hundreds were taken by the good Lord. The year is 1658. Cromwell dies of malaria. Within two years, the Royalists had their revenge. Cromwell's embalmed body was dug up and beheaded. But after the revenge of the Royalist was over, how has history judged Oliver Cromwell? This man took the throne of three kingdoms without the name of king, but with a greater power and authority than had been claimed by any king the greatest, because the most typical Englishman of all time. At the end of the 19th century, some of the older women would still threaten naughty children with the name of Oliver Cromwell. If you aren't a good girl, old Oliver will have thee. We can see him as the fiery fighter for freedom, or the clever politician using all his skill to keep a hated army rule going. So, Oliver Cromwell, Hero or villain? At first, how glorious. He destroyed all the enemies of Parliament. But then, such betrayal. His ambition overtook him, he crushed us underfoot, and all that would oppose him he had removed. The days of Oliver Cromwell were marvellous days of prosperity, liberty, peace. Confused? Cromwell provoked strong feelings of love, of hatred, and these... Under my rule, the people know protection and peace they would truly drown in blood. His name, Oliver Cromwell. He was a gentleman farmer who fought for Parliament in the Civil War, who rose to the rank of Commander-in-Chief of the Army, who signed the death warrant of King Charles I, who ruled England, Scotland, and Ireland alone from 1653 to 1658. Different judgments, different interpretations didn't stop on his death. He's kept historians arguing ever since. Discovering the truth may not be possible. So, first, Cromwell the Army General.
It is 1645. Two English armies face each other, one for the king, the other for parliament. The final battle of the first... But what sort of man was he? When Cromwell died, they wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a coffin lined with lead. Yet his foul stench still broke free. And truly his name and memory stinks even greater than did his corpse. People look back on the days of Oliver Cromwell and praise him so. What brave things he did, and oh, how all the neighboring princes did fear him. First civil war is about to be fought. The enemy was drawn up, ready to give us battle at Naseby. We would have been cut off before we were drawn into battle formation. But Lieutenant General Cromwell drew us up into a body, ready to face the enemy. We marched yesterday after the king. After three hours very doubtful fight, we at last routed his army. Sir, this is none other but the hand of God